Chapter 28 McCarran called Tom the next day from Rome, wanting the names of everyone Dickie had known in Mongebello. That was apparently all that McCarran wanted to know, because he took a leisurely time getting them all, and checking them off against the list that Marge had given him. Most of the names Marge had already given him, but Tom went through them all with their difficult addresses. Giorgio, of course. Pietro, the boatkeeper. Faustos Atamaria, whose last name he didn't know, though he told McCarran in a complicated way how to get to her house. Aldo, the grocer. The Czechies. And even old Stevenson, the recluse painter who lived just outside the village and whom Tom had never met. It took Tom several minutes to list them all, and it would take McCarran several days to check on them, probably. He mentioned everybody but Signor Pucci, who had handled the sale of Dickie's house and boat, and who would undoubtedly tell McCarran if he had learned it through Marge that Tom Ripley had come to Mongebello to arrange Dickie's affairs. Tom did not think it very serious one way or the other if McCarran did know that he had taken care of Dickie's affairs, and a people like Aldo and Stevenson, McCarran was welcome to all he could get out of them. Anyone in Naples, McCarran asked? Not that I know of. Rome? I'm sorry I never saw him with any friends in Rome. Never met the painter uh, Di Massimo? No, I saw him once, Tom said, but I never met him. What does he look like? Well, it was just on a street corner. I left Decky and he was going to meet him, so it wasn't very close to him. He looked about five feet nine, about 50, grayish black hair. That's about all I remember. He looked rather solidly built. He was wearing a light gray suit, I remember. Hmm, okay, McCarran said absently, as if it were writing it all down. Well, I guess that's about it. Thanks very much, Mr. Ripley. You're very welcome. Good luck. Then Tom waited quietly in his house for several days, just as anybody would do, if the search for the missing friend had reached its intensest point. He declined three or four invitations to parties. The newspaper had renewed their interest in Dickie's disappearance, inspired by the presence in Italy of an American private detective who had been hired by Dickie's father. When some photographers from Europea and Oji came to take pictures of him at his house, he told them firmly to leave, and Ashley took one insisted young man by the elbow and propelled him across the living room towards the door. But nothing of any importance happened for five days. No telephone calls, no letters, even from Tenete Roverini. Tom imagined the worst sometimes, especially at dusk when he felt more depressed than at any other time of day. He imagined Roverini and McCarran getting together and developing the theory that Dickie could have disappeared in November. Imagine McCarran checking on the time he had bought his car. Imagine him picking up a scent when he found out that Dickie had not come back after the San Remo trip and that Tom Ripley had come down to arrange for the disposal of Dickie's things. He measured and remeasured Mr. Greenleaf's tired, indifferent goodbye and the last morning in Venice, interpreted as unfriendly, and imagine Mr. Greenleaf flying into a rage in Rome when no results came of all the efforts to find Dickie, and suddenly demanding a thorough investigation of Tom Ripley, that scoundrel he had sent over with his own money to try to get his son home. But each morning Tom was optimistic again. On the good side was the fact that Marge unquestionably believed that Dickie had spent those months sulking in Rome, and she would have kept all his letters, and she would probably bring them all out to show to McCarran. Excellent letters they were, too. Tom was glad he had spent so much thought on them. Marge was on an asset rather than a liability. It was really a very good thing that he had put down his shoes that night that she had found the rings. Every morning he watched the sun from his bedroom window, rising through the winter mists, struggling upwards over the peaceful-looking city. Breaking through finally and giving a couple of hours of actual sunshine before noon, and the quiet beginning of each day was like a promise of peace in the future. The days were growing warmer. There was more light and less rain. Spring was almost here, and one of these mornings, one morning finer than these, he would leave the house and board a ship for Greece. On the evening of the sixth day after Mr. Greenleaf and McCarran had left, 
Tom called him in Rome. Mr. Greenleaf had nothing new to report, but Tom had not expected anything. Marge had gone home. As long as Mr. Greenleaf was in Italy, Tom thought, the papers would carry something about the case every day. But the newspapers were running out of a sensational thing to say about the Greenleaf case. And how is your wife? Tom asked. Fair. I think the strain is telling on her, however. I spoke to her again last night. Oh, I'm so sorry, Tom said. He ought to write her a nice letter, he thought. Just a friendly word while Mr. Greenleaf was away and she was by herself. He wished he had thought of it before. Mr. Greenleaf said he would be leaving at the end of the week via Paris, where the French police were also carrying on the search. McCarran was going with him, and if nothing happened in Paris, they were both going home. It's obvious to me, or to anybody, Mr. Greenleaf said, that he's either dead or deliberately hiding. There's not a corner of the world where the search for him hasn't been publicized. Short of Russia, maybe. My God, he never showed any liking for that place, did he? Russia? No, not that I know of. Apparently, Mr. Greenleaf's attitude was that Dicky was either dead or to hell with him. During that telephone call, the to hell with him attitude seemed to be up to for most. Tom went over to Peter Smith Kingley's house the same evening. Peter had a couple of English newspapers that his friend had sent him, one with a picture of Tom ejecting the OG photographer from his house. Tom had seen in the Italian newspaper, too. Pictures of him on the street of Venice and pictures of his house had also reached America. Bob and Cleo both had airmailed him photographs and write-ups from New York tabloids. They thought it was all terribly exciting. I'm good and sick of it, Tom said. I'm only hanging around here to be polite and to help if I can. If any more reporters try to crash my house, they're going to get with a shotgun as soon as they walk in the door. He really was irritated and disgusted, and it sounded in his voice. I quite understand, Peter said. I'm going home at the end of May, you know. If you like to come along and stay at my place in Ireland, you're more than welcome. It's deadly quiet there, I can assure you. Tom glanced at him. Peter had told him about it, his old Irish castle and had showed him pictures of it. Some quality of his relationship with Dickie flashed across his mind like the memory of a nightmare, like a pale and evil ghost. It was because the same thing could happen with Peter, he thought. Peter, the uptight, unsuspecting, naive, generous, good fellow, except that he didn't look enough like Peter. But one evening, for Pete's amusement, he had put on an English accent and had imitated Peter's mannerism and his way of jerking his head to one side as he talked, and Peter had thought it hilariously funny. He should have done that, Tom thought now. It makes Tom bitterly ashamed. That evening and the fact that he had thought, even for an instant, that the same thing that had happened with Dickie could happen with Peter. Thanks, Tom said. I'd better stay by myself for a while longer. I miss my friend Dickie, you know. I miss him terribly. He was suddenly near tears. He could remember Dickie's smile the first day they began to get along, when he had confessed to Dickie that his father had sent him. He remembered that crazy first trip to Rome. He remembered with affection even that half hour in the Carlton Bar in Cannes, when Dickie had been so bored and silent, but there had been a reason why Dickie had been bored. After all, he had dragged Dickie there, and Dickie didn't care for the Cote d'Azur. If he only gotten his sightseeing done all by himself, Tom thought, if he only hadn't been in such a hurry and so greedy, if he only hadn't misjudged the relationship between Dickie and Marge so stupidly, or had simply waited for them to separate of their own volition, then none of this would have happened, and he could have lived with Dickie for the rest of his life, traveling and lived and enjoyed living for the rest of his life if he only had put Dickie's clothes that day. I understand, Tommy boy. I really do, Peter said, patting his shoulder. Tom looked up at him through distorted tears. He was imagining traveling with Dickie on some liner back to America for Christmas holidays, imagining being on good terms with Dickie's parents as if he and Dickie had been brothers. Thanks, Tom said. It came out a childlike blub. I really think something was a matter with you if you didn't break down like this, Peter said sympathetically.